Hello, everyone. Welcome to week eight of communication uh, 200, Introduction to Communication. Today, we have a very specialized panel. We have five guests among us. Um, and this is, a, uh, I think, an important event for all of us in this class and all the, also the department, uh, because throughout the quarter, we have uh, looked into various communication concepts, theories, arguments, and examples. Uh, so today, we are actually going to see the direct connection between the theory and practices in the field of communication uh, and also journalism uh, partly engaged with this uh, industry. So in this career-oriented lecture, we have the privilege to hear from several UW alumni uh, who are currently thriving in communication-related roles. So they will generously share the insights into their experience studying communication and other subjects at the University of Washington. And they will also discuss uh, their unique career paths and they will help us to shed light onto the challenges they face. And they will also provide us valuable perspectives on how they navigated their journey to reach their current positions. So uh, this goal of this lecture is to uh, deepen your understanding for communication and journalism major programs uh, in the Department of Communication and uh, potentially give you indication of career paths ahead. Um, and the moderator, uh, Elizabeth here, will guide the discussion by posing a set of questions uh, to our esteemed alumni and will conclude the session with a Q&A with the alumni. So please feel free to um, ask questions directly during the Q&A session and uh, post question on the chat box. Uh, and it would be great if you can keep the questions uh, specific to a person or the alumni in general. So with this, I want to thank, take a moment to thank uh, all the panelists uh, for coming to this COM200 class. And also thanks to the Department of Communication for organizing, especially Megan and the support team for coordinating uh, the time and the availability of this uh, five esteemed guests. Uh, so thank you for being here. So Elizabeth, please take it away. Hi, I'm Hi, Elizabeth. I'm, Elizabeth. Um, I'm one of the content core interns for the Department of Communication for Winter Quarter right now. So we just help with the newsletter and also with some events that go on like this at the department. Um, so if we could have each of our alumni share their name, their job title, and also when they graduated. I guess I'll start. I'm uh, Gretchen Enders. I'm a TV writer. I was uh, an, actually an art history major, but my whole job is about communication. So I think that's why I'm here. And I was class of 1999. Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Prodente. I am a development officer at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. And I graduated in 1994 as a speech comm major. I can go next. I am Autumn Hyatt, and I am the owner and founder of two companies, um, one nonprofit, one uh, regular LLC. Um, I've had a long career in uh, technology sales, actually. Um, and just now I'm starting a couple of businesses. So entrepreneurship is, is pretty new to me. Um, and it's been about 20 years uh, since I graduated. Uh, now, okay. apologies in advance. Uh, my Wi-Fi isn't the best today. We're having a, a bit of a storm here in the Bay Area, but uh, thank you guys for having me. A uh, very proud third generation graduate of the University of Washington. Uh, my name is McCall Hall, and I'm a major gifts officer for Stanford University, specifically the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, I graduated from UW in 2010. Uh, as I mentioned, my grandmother uh, graduated from UW. My parents met at UW, so I am uh, a diehard Husky through and through, um, and I look forward to sharing a little bit about my career. Great, and I'm uh, Victoria Brame. I'm the Senior Director of Communications at the American Feet Industry Association. We are located right outside of Washington, D.C., um, so thank you for hosting this virtually so that I could attend. I am a 
communications, poli sci, double major from 2007. Okay, I think everyone shares. So our first question is going to be, how have the skills you learned through the communication department helped you both in your regular job duties and also in your general professional journey? I'm happy to start us off. Um, it was nice to reflect on some of the core classes and, and skills that we were introduced to in our undergraduate studies for me 30 some years ago, um, but I'm truly using those skills on the daily and they have truly helped guide me in the various roles and organizations I've been a part of over a 20 plus year career. And so I just wanted to name what they are briefly. Um, every day I'm engaging in interpersonal dialogue and establishing rapport with empathy and inclusivity with diverse uh, individuals and, and groups. So that's a skill that I employ daily and have been honing for years. Um, I'm working on pers persuasive writing and speaking every day. I am a fundraiser. I, I bring in philanthropic dollars for our institution. And so I need to overcome obstacles and um, uh, arguments or, or uh, you know, um, ideas that others have as to why they might not be able to engage phil philanthropically with, with their alma mater here at Whitman College. So persuasive writing and speaking is a key skill I learned at UW in my courses. And finally, I would just share, um, uh, if I were to pick another one, active listening. Um, just truly being someone who, again, empathetically and compassionately listens to others and retains the key parts of their story uh, is an incredible skill in fundraising. And I think McCall and I share a similar career path. So I'll be curious to hear what you say, McCall. But thank you. Those are just some of the top skills that came to mind that are incredibly important every day in my work. I can, I can share. Um, so, you know, Going through the communication degree, you know, I have a little um, personal thought about the degree itself in general. And, you know, when I first started getting my communications degree, I kind of thought when you tell people, they're like, oh, communications degree. And I truly feel like we, the ones that have selected communications to be our degree are the ones that have chosen a skill set and focused multiple years on a skill set that has helped our life in every facet, right? So in going to be a doctor, I mean, that's that's wonderful, right? I mean, that's a wonderful gift to the world, but in communication, you are gonna use that from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep every single day. And so focusing on that and understanding how you communicate and how others communicate will ultimately really- I'm gonna try to here. Sorry, did were you? My apologies. My oh, your Wi-Fi is going in and out. Okay, so um oh I can't hear. Uh anyways, I um I'll just kind of share how I've used it directly in my career path and my career journey. So first of all, communication theory, I really wanted to be a theorist. So I studied a theory by someone by the name of George Gerbner and um, loved his theory and had this big dream of being a theorist. Um, and it turned out that I ended up in sales. And so as a salesperson um, and a fairly technical world, right? And so um, as a woman in sales, it's different. The technical jargon is different. Um, how you're talking to people, how they're talking to you. Um, and, and actually, we in sales, you have the power of using communication for better or for worse, right? Because there are salespeople that use it for potentially manipulation. But there is a wonderful gift that if you really can understand how others communicate in sales, you can make people feel really good about the decisions that they make. And so I remember thinking about sales. I never wanted to go be, you know, the car salesman rap kind of, you know, deal, but I wanted, but what I found is that really understanding, focusing on how they were communicating gave me so much joy in being in sales. 
And so I ended up being in leadership and teaching others that, hey, you don't have to do exactly what others tell you to do and say, you can feel your way through the conversation, right? And and focus on giving the gift to that person that needs to buy something. We're talking about millions of dollars of things. Give them the gift of feeling really good about the decision that they're making. So communications has really helped me um, in all facets of my life. So sorry, McCall, I know, I think you were trying to no, my apologies. I, I wasn't sure if you were if you were done because my internet keeps going in and out. Um, again, apologies, you guys, uh, but I'll, I'll try to answer this question. I believe you guys were asking how does our degree impact our work, and uh, I won't I won't bore you with all of the details. I think Susan did a wonderful job of of giving that level of overview for a development officer. Um, but I will say that I started my career uh, after graduating from U from U Dub in front of the camera, so. Uh, I was the media personality for a professional basketball team for the LA Sparks in, in Los Angeles, California. And 30 nights per summer, I'm in front of a camera in the middle of Staples Center. So I, I can immediately tell you that uh, communication certainly has a has a, a role in that type of work. But I am I'm probably very different than a lot of communications, uh, excuse me, development officers, because I started off in TV career in sports broadcast, uh, doing in-game entertainment, uh, sports sideline reporting, play-by-play. Uh, -play. And so having the opportunity to transition from speaking and communicating for an audience that you will never see because you're in front of a camera, you, you actually don't see these people. You're just trying to break through the glass so that they feel you to now being in a situation where you are literally every day taking meetings with people uh, to persuade um persuade them to to give money to your institution i can't i can't um speak highly enough uh, about the world of communications and the power of communications uh, i i can look those who uh, have a mastery of, of communication and 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 saying that my connection is unstable again, but I'll just end it with um, those of you guys who can who can master the art of communication, I do believe will make a lot more money than those who can't. Um, I think that the world of AI is wonderful and there's a lot of uh, money and re research going into AI, but the ability to connect um, in an inter interpersonal fashion implementing communication into your strategy. Yeah, as a, as a TV writer, you know, I don't know if you've heard about the strike that went on last year, it seemed like forever, um, but <laughs> we are dealing with these issues of AI, like McCall was talking about. So that's why I'm kind of jumping in, because as a writer, there are really two parts of my job, which um, a lot of time is spent by myself in this dark uh, little cave of an office, um, writing and developing on my own. But where I have the most joy is when I'm actually in a writer's room and coming kind of around <laughs> from a different angle uh, to communications, I realize how invaluable it is, those interpersonal relationships, being able to read a room, being able to you know take those nonverbal cues from your boss or from other writers where you can jump in, um, where you're you know, your skills are best served, which might not always be pitching a joke, but perhaps, you know, helping with morale. There's all these different facets of, of working as a team. I do consider it team sports versus individual sports, like when I'm playing volleyball as opposed to pole vaulting, um, but working as a team um, and just being able to really be the most uh, valuable that you can be. And I think that that's all via communications and those that, that do know how to work with other people are uh, in short supply here. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and be honest, wish, wish there were more communications majors in this field. Um, but, and, and also coming around from the backside, I think my, uh, I took improv for a long time and cause I, I did want to be an actress to start. Um, McCall, I was also trying to be in front of the camera here in LA. It's a tough gig. Um, but I realized that it's not about trying to be the funniest, but it's about those relationships and connecting with people. And that has been the best tool in my little tool belt that I could have ever asked for.
Hey, um, so I can go ahead and jump in. Um, so I think one of the things that I have really taken away from communications is maybe kind of niche, but the essentials of argument class and how you can build a good argument for your case. A lot of the communications that I've done throughout my career has been on uh, somewhat controversial issues, whether it's um, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, now I'm in animal agriculture. I seem to somehow find my way into industries that um, there are two sides of an issue and we're representing an association that has a, an issue or a policy stance. So we take our communications to Capitol Hill or the federal agencies, and you really do have to be pretty persuasive in what it is, what message you're carrying with you and how that will act. Uh, the other ones I think about are branding and thinking about the integrity of your brand and your key messages and what you want people to think about. Um, I've definitely dealt with my share of crisis communications throughout my career and making sure that not only you can communicate throughout the crisis, but what is that going to look like long term in terms of issue management and brand reputation? And then the other one I really took away was mass media communications and how things are changing for journalism and how things are communicated out to people and how they are perceiving information. And that is something that, you know, as communications people, we are always having to change tactics to think about how we can um, evolve with how journalism is evolving and the platforms that are being used to communicate. Um, and so, you know, when I was at UW, Facebook was a very new thing. And now I have our um, very new grads coming out of college, working on our communication staff, and they're telling me about all kinds of other ways to communicate directly with people. So, you know, being able to understand what's coming and how you can adapt your strategy and get your message out and know that people are only going to care a couple for a couple of seconds about what you're talking about. Um, and then you have that really, you know, quick moment to make that message stick. That those are some of the skills that I took away from the communications degree. So our next question is, which of your experiences within the communication department helped you both in your regular job duties? Oh, I'm sorry, that was the one I just started before. Um, which of your experiences within the communication department or in relation to comms did you find to be the most valuable and why? And to make it flow better, I'll call on you guys. Um, so if Susan could go first. Sure, thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, what came to mind first um, was a required senior internship. And I don't, of course, know the um, graduation requirements that are current today, but back in the, the mid 90s, uh, we did have an internship requirement. And I'm so grateful for that uh, to this day. It really was a game changer for me uh, because it got me off campus. I had to do it, you know, it was an academic requirement. We had to find our own um, uh, organization industry, wherever we wanted to be, uh, we had to do that leg work, which I think is really valuable um, to do your own research and networking and have the support of the, the department, but to be the one uh, setting up your next venture. So anyway, I, I landed at Seattle Children's Hospital. Probably many of you on here know where that is, just right up the hill, Sandpoint Way from the college or from the university. And um, it was a game changer because I had also been interested in sports marketing, but I didn't land an internship there. I landed one in the nonprofit philanthropic sector at you know, public health care. And that's what grabbed my heart, my passion, and I've never left. Um, I've always been in the realm of, of philanthropy, working for a variety of nonprofits over the last 20 years from international relief and development to early childhood development. Now I'm in educational fundraising for private institutions. So um, I'm grateful for that time that UW said I had to have, you know, to graduate because I had to do a 20 page paper. I had a great mentor. And again, I was exposed for the very first time to the power of fundraising. Um, the internship, just real in brief, was uh, with the foundation there that raised millions of dollars every year for their uncompensated care fund, which was the pot of money that helped families with kids with cancer uh, meet their, you know, overwhelming and really 
insurmountable medical bills. Uh, so that was a beautiful space to be in as a young, what, 21, 22 year old. And I really believed in the work. And what my role was, was to actually walk around the, the floors of a hospital and interview patients and families and write stories on them. And I still have some of those uh, newsletters today that I, they weren't digital, that dates me. <laughs> they're paper and they're they're turning yellow. Um, they mean they mean the world to me because it really was what kickstarted my career in philanthropy was that internship that experiential learning outside the classroom that was required, unpaid, worth every hour I spent up at, at Seattle Children. So thanks. If Autumn if could go Autumn next. Could... Is that Autumn? Yeah. Um, you know, I can't remember which class. It was probably the mass media class, but there was a class where we ended up having to create a website and the way that you did it back then was way different than hopping on to GoDaddy. We were actually like having to write code, but really what we were focused on was the dissemination of a message via different mediums. And so it was important. I think the technical side of having to create that website was really interesting. And I found a, a respect for that world. Uh, but I think the importance of how do we communicate this message through a website? How do we communicate this message through, you know, a podcast or audio message? Um, and, you know, as a salesperson, you're in sales, you're having to talk about your own personal brand. You're having to talk about the product's brand. And you do that in many different ways. And now as a business owner, you know, I have to get my message across quickly in an email or, you know, on a website or, you know, in a pamphlet. Um, and those are all very, it's very different ways that people receive a message depending upon the way that they're engaging with what that message is. If Gretchen could go next. Okay, this might be a little bit roundabout, so sorry, please follow me. Um, I did uh, a study abroad, abroad program my junior year. Um, I was in Rome, and uh, the program was amazing. What it really gave me for the first time in my life, I mean, I was 20 years old at the time, I realized how small I was, and um, that it wasn't all just my story, right? There are so many stories out there. And I think that that I've, I've kind of carried that throughout my career in in a way in which um, I see how my behavior affects the whole, right? Um, I, I, I'm never not thinking of if, if I'm late to this meeting, how is that going to affect other people? And I know I said it was a roundabout way, like just being the small, like a little drip in a big bucket. Um, I recently had a friend tell me that she was, she's on a, a Netflix show and it was 11 o'clock at night and there was this little writer's room and they were just like looking at their watches and they hadn't heard from their boss in a while. And so she finally stood up and she's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to text him and see what we should be working on. It's 11 o'clock at night. And so she said, you know, she texted him like, Hey, is there anything specific that we should be working on? Cause you know, we're, we're kind of, we've reached the end of what we've been doing. And he's like, Oh, you guys are still there? No, go home. And it was this, like, I was furious for her, but this idea that you have to constantly be thinking about what's going on around you, how what you're doing is affecting other people or what you're not doing is affecting other people and how that just kind of reverberates through, um, through your day. So that's kind of what I've been taking forward in me with my career. And then McCall? If you have Wi-Fi, yeah. So we'll get we'll get this another shot. Uh, I again will piggyback. Um, I believe someone mentioned internships as being an important part of their learning experience and what has probably played a, a major role um, in their current uh, career opportunities. And I would agree. So when I was at the University of Washington, I worked for a defunct franchise. Now. Many of you guys are probably too young to even know about the Seattle Supersonics, but I worked for the Seattle Supersonics for uh, some years as just an intern. But one of the things that 
really supported me by being an intern in the public relations department was the power of relationships. Uh, in two or three summers, I developed enough relationships to where moving to LA and becoming a media personality wasn't that hard because I had developed all of these relationships within the WNBA and the NBA. And so when it was time for me to make moves, I had the relationships and I, I can't I can't uh, I can't stress how important relationships are in this business. Um, and communication plays a vital role in maintaining relationships. But absolutely, if it if it hadn't been for um, my internship requirement for me, it was also required. Uh, I, I I would not be in the position that I'm in because I had the opportunity to develop relationships. Can I piggyback on that real quick? Because I think that that is is truly so important. And I have a lot of um, younger writers that I I work with, and they they talk about networking and oh, it feels so gross. But um, I'm always like, no, you're going out with people that you have a genuine connection with. That it's not false. You can, if you're curious about other humans, you can find a connection point with them, and really just hone that and and turn those connections into friendships, and that will. I mean, honestly, it, it's it's not networking if you're hanging out with your friends um, and that will serve you throughout the years. I guarantee it. Now, Victoria. Uh, well, I was going to save this answer for the end, but since you all have laid it out so eloquently, um, internship was not a requirement when I was at UW. However, um, being a first generation child in my family to go to a four year university, I was very curious about internships and had considered doing an internship at, um, in Washington State Capitol. But since I'm not originally from um, Washington, I really was looking to go somewhere else. And so my advisors there in the communications department and the political science department had told me about the Washington Center in Washington, D.C. And so I spent the fall 2006 out there doing an internship at the White House um, where we were writing political briefs that went directly to the president, vice president, and senior leadership team there during the midterm elections. Um, it was just such a great experience to be there and kind of the icing on the cake was the region that we were focusing on for with my boss was I included the Washington State area and like most of the Pacific Northwest and so when I came back to Seattle to finish out my senior year I actually started making some connections back in Seattle so across the country, um, if you even if you want to go somewhere else and you're thinking about it, there's no better time to do that than when you're in college and trying something new. And um, like the others have said, you know, you will most likely find people that you can relate to. D.C. has a huge contingent of D.C. dogs. They get together regularly. These are just other D.C. folks. We all cheer on um, you dub. We were very sad when we just lost uh, the bowl game, but you know you will find other folks um, from other areas there and be able to incorporate that in your career. And I I always credited my advisors for giving me that gentle nudge and especially sweet talking my parents into going to DC. Um, the other thing that I would just point out really quickly that was valuable for me. Um, at the time, Professor Matt McGarity was setting up a public speaking center. I'm not sure if it's still at UW, but I was uh, one of the first tutors there in that department. Public speaking is something that a lot of people struggle with, but just getting that opportunity to do a class where you are forced to speak in front of other people, it helps build your own confidence. But I have found in my degree, I mean, in my job, I spend a lot of my time building the confidence of our spokespeople before they do media interviews or go into a Hill office or um, speak on a panel. I spend an inordinate amount of time in confidence building with these folks. And I think a lot of that comes from the public speaking center and being able to say what you're trying to communicate um, you know, to others. I find it very ironic that at the time we were doing some program where the public speaking center was also 
partnered with like some sort of aquaculture or oceans class. And I remember thinking that aquaculture was the most boring thing and how in the world could I ever talk about fish and fish farming. And now as part of my job at the American Feed Industry Association, I am proud to say that I represent uh, feed manufacturers who make feed for fish um, along with other species. But you just really know, you really never know where a project that you work on in college will come back and be in your life again in a different way. Um, but those are the two things I would definitely recommend. Communicating out loud, doing that in a public speaking setting, building those skills. You may be using those to help inspire other people and then looking into internships. Okay, our next question is the UW Communication Department places an emphasis on equity in a lot of its coursework. If you're comfortable sharing, how have DEI matters come up in your career and how have you handled them? And also what lessons have they taught you? So if Susan could go first again. Certainly, thank you for such a complex, timely question, right? Um, uh, I have a lot of thoughts here and I'll, I'll keep it brief, uh, but I wanted to say that our team here at Whitman, I am on the development and alumni relations team. We work very closely with our admissions team as well. We are currently doing a lot of hard work, a lot of good labor um, by the direction of our vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, we just had, a, we did all, we all submitted a rubric that did a self-assessment and a team assessment. This is within the last 12 months. And then our um, DEIB team is now walking us through trainings that include books, podcasts, a consultant, because um, a lot of areas of inequity have been um, identified where we have staff retention issues and, and some um, unhappy people and some um, some deep wounds because of these the issue of, of uh, the lack of, of equity amongst our, our staff. So uh, that's not even going into the student space right now, right? Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that, that uh, for you, you know, you um, undergrads here on the call, just know that um, this work is here to stay, right? Our VP of, of DEIB Friday afternoon at our session, he just said, um, we will fail if we don't do this work. And not just we as Whitman, but we as humans, <laughs> we as community members, we as civic leaders, we as... Um, as uh, individuals who hopefully really do care about each other as, as uh, um, valuable human beings. So this work is essential, it's hard, it's messy, it's costly, it's time consuming, it's fatiguing. And I sit here, right, as a middle-class white woman saying these things, so I recognize that too and wanna just put that out there. But I think something I had on my mind to bring to you, um, you class members here is, you know, ask yourself when you are getting into internships and, and um, the, the real world, as we like to say, you're, you're in it. Don't, don't think anything other than that. But when you're looking for your first professional work, at, really be mindful and, and ask those questions during interviews. You know, where are the equity opportunities on this team? And really, really listen and really evaluate. Is this a healthy place where I want to, to, to work? I, I just challenge you with that to be a critical um, person um, and, and to know what you bring. A lot of things have been said today about what communications folks bring to teamwork and collaborative work, right? So um, I think a positive way for me to look at um, the issue of equity right now is asking that very question, where are the opportunities for equity? Kind of assuming that there's inequity that's in existence, right? Because it's pervasive. It just is in our power structures and positionality and the way that institutions and organizations and businesses work. So look for those areas, know that the work is necessary or we fail as a society um, and, and do the hard work. You know, you go on that run down to Green Lake, put on a podcast about equity issues in the workplace, um, go to a speaker on campus. You can only imagine the amazing people that are coming and going from UW these days compared to when I was even there. Um, read the books, do the work, um, talk amongst your friends, be a change maker as you can be in terms of um, owning your own voice, learning how to take risks, uh, offer other people grace in this space of equity and inequity and um, offer yourself grace as well. And I'll pause there, lots of more to hear from the other panelists, but hard topic to wrap up with a bow, right? <laughs> and now Autumn. 
Sure. Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, it's really a, a little bit back to what Gretchen was talking about in awareness of self. And I think, you know, being in a career where you are selling, you really have to be aware that you are not making assumptions about who the buyer might be. Um, and there, there's a lot of accidents. I remember in my early years, not, I, I will share an accident of mine, but um, that others would make. I think someone told me a story where <clears throat> they went in to go meet a CIO and you know, I think that the name of the person was kind of, you know, you could, you didn't know if it was a man or a woman and the woman came and sat in the room, but took the sales rep into the conference room and sat down and the, and the salesperson sat there, was typing away on their computer and five minutes goes by and looks at the, the gal and says, okay, so, you know, when is this person coming into the room? And she said, I am that person. And so they just made a, an assumption that since, she ushered them in that she wasn't the CIO. And so there was just that five minutes that they didn't behave in a way that um, they probably should have. So there's a, lots of awareness out in the world of who you think players are. You have to do your best to try to remove that. The other one is a personal experience that I have at, in sales, oftentimes there's lots of conferences and we were in Vegas and I had a particular organization that was a customer of mine and they were headquartered in India. And um, I was meeting the CEO for the first time and many other C-level executives. And I was hosting dinner for them and made reservations. And it wasn't until, you know, and I was very nervous right about this and I was really caught up and just calming myself down and getting really focused and being professional and <clears throat> I got lost so much in that that I didn't realize I booked dinner at a steakhouse and it was not conducive to an organization that's based in India they're just you know there's a lot of non-meat eaters right beef eaters so I quickly had to change the reservations um, to another spot, but I was not being aware, <laughs> right? So that's an example of when I wasn't aware and I really wasn't focused on the customer. I was focused on my nerves and calming myself down. So um, yeah, that's just what I, what I wanted to share. And next, and Gretchen. Next Gretchen. Um, well, I started in the entertainment industry about 10 years ago. <clears throat> Um, and even in that 10 years, I've, there's just been a, a real shift and it's been so wonderful. Um, it used to be that, I mean, even when I, 10 years ago, it was not that long ago, um, I would be the only woman in the room and certainly the, everybody was white. And um, it's only been in the last couple of years where I felt that those rooms have really reflected the stories that we're telling and also just the audience at large. Um, and now that I'm moving up and I'm uh, I'm staffing my own rooms, that has been a commitment that I've made to myself and, and to my work that I want a diversity of stories of backgrounds. Um, and so I think it really comes, it, it always comes from the top down. And so as you move up, you have to challenge yourself. It's not even a challenge. You're making the, for me, my, making my show better because I am, I, I'm getting all these different stories. Um, and also for me, it's it's just been broadening what I watch, what I listen to, what I read, um, and that has just it's it's <laughs> broadened my horizons more than I can ever say. But it really is, I think, that you start with with what you're taking in and and um, and what you, what you may not know that you don't know, right? So it's just kind of challenging yourself to constantly be pushing that and not getting comfortable in whatever like little sphere that you might already be in. And now Nicole. Yeah, so DEI uh, is, is uh, 
important to, to myself just personally, but as it relates to my professional experience, um, I, I have to say that DEI has always been um, a high priority for all the organizations I've been a part of. Like I mentioned, I started my career in sports and in business, right? So when you're talking about the NBA, MLB, the NFL, uh, even uh, recently with USC athletics and, and uh, USC football, um, inclusion has always been a, a major, a major um, priority for these organizations because number one, as you're as we're talking about athletes, uh, a lot of athletes come from different backgrounds. And so um, making sure that we're stressing the importance of having um, empathy and, and acceptance uh, has always been a major a major theme of my career. Um, but I will, I, I will talk about a time DEI came into play and I didn't understand that what I was working on was truly a DEI effort. And that was my work with the Special Olympics World Games. Um, these are athletes who have intellectual disabilities. Uh, and I think that as I have grown in my career, um, when you're in your 20s and you're young, you 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 think about your first identifiers. I'm a I'm a black woman, so you think in in you know those those obvious identifiers. But truly and in, in, in sincerely, diversity is so so far beyond just our, our immediate identifiers. And and there are so many diverse people um, on this planet and, and right here in this great country that we live in. Um, and, and to really create a, a culture of acceptance and inclusion, we have to think about all aspects of diversity. And I think the more that we can familiarize ourselves with just different people, um, the better it will, will help us in conversations uh, to create change. I will say this though, at my current job, we've had a lot of issues as it relates to um, our response to uh, some really tough, intense uh, global matters, right? And we have students from all around the globe and uh, alumni, and they expect us to have um, opinions and and make uh, statements about different diverse issues. And this is why it's so important, in, in my opinion, and I've stressed this at work, that we have groups and places where we can find out what those um, what those what those uh, sentiments are from from varying groups and and and, and um, represent uh, represent represented uh, organizations. You know, I I think that some of the the aftermath of of what happened with the the war, the Hamas war, and and um, the bombings uh, in Israel, you know, what the beauty that came out of that at Stanford, and I can only speak to Stanford, um, is that we have, have, we've had more dialogue amongst uh, student groups that have very unique identifiers. And now we have formalized creating those groups so that students have a place to be heard, to be seen. And also when we have questions where we can go to have those questions answered. So I, I can only speak to just in the past, few months, I have seen why DEI is truly important because when things do happen globally, um, we need to have a system and a structure to, uh, number one, find solutions and help heal, but also obtain feedback um, and, and having the opportunity to, to uh, hear feedback right away from our students has played a, a vital role for us here at Stanford. But yeah, I can't stress enough why, uh, that DEI is really important um, to have within our organizations. And again, it's not just your immediate identifiers, but uh, diversity is is widespread. And now Victoria. Yeah, um, I think the others have covered it so well. Um, in my position, one of the things that we work on is our events and education programs for people throughout uh, the feed and pet food industry supply chain. And as you can imagine, animal agriculture, agriculture in the U.S. is predominantly older white men approaching retirement. And in a lot of cases, these are the same people who are filling boardrooms. Um, however, there's such a big need for workforce in the agriculture industry as a whole in the future, and they know that with, you know, the median age somewhere around 55 that we need younger people, we need to attract them in new and different ways, and we need them from all walks of life. And so one of the things that we do at AFIA is we bring together speakers who can speak to some of the senior leaders about some of these issues, and it's really changing how decisions are being made in C-suite and everything from word choice on recruitment and where they're recruiting and all of those kinds of things that, that the industry as a whole has been looking at. Um, and then going back to one of the earlier comments, you know, I think from a diversity 
perspective. I mean, my, what I was thinking of from a personal experience, having worked in a nuclear weapons and then the nuclear power industry, it was not uncommon for me to be the only female in the room. And whenever we were dealing with emotional issues that, especially if they were attached to families and what parents were making decisions and realizing that you're the only female in that room, you can bring such a powerful voice and making sure that those who are more senior understand where there are voids and that they need more folks around that table to represent other views. I mean, that's been one thing that I have tried to do throughout my career is making sure that when I look around the room, we, we do have some diversity there in opinion and it's not all coming from the same source. Because once again, if you think about messaging and communicating, you're talking to different audiences um, with, that bring different emotions and all of those kinds of things. So being sensitive to those different groups is something that, that we strive for. And then it also trickles down to any, when we look at our communication, also looking at any imagery that's being used um, so that it does show more diversity. Because I think within the agriculture industry, yes, you still have a big contingent of white males who are dominating business. But if you look at the people who are working at manufacturing facilities, they come from all walks of life. Many are in rural America that don't even have access to broadband. And I know, you know, when I lived in Seattle, it's just hard to fathom that there's whole pockets of the country that do not have access to broadband. And that can become a huge challenge if you're in a pandemic and everyone is now on Zoom and you don't have access to that or accessing healthcare or any of those other issues. So, um, you know, I guess for, from our perspective, really looking at how are we going to attract the next generation workforce into this field and challenging our leaders now. And like I said, from AFIA, since we are a convener of many of these organizations as much as possible. We try to get on our agenda um, speakers from uh, who can speak to DEI issues. Um, our last question for today is, what would you recommend for current communication students to do during their time in undergrad to prepare them for life after UW? So we'll start with Susan again. Yeah, thank you. I would encourage each of you to really get to know, I don't have a number, but you know, two to four, I guess, if I were to choose a number for you, professors or staffers at UW within the department, outside the department, but pursue some mentors and leaders that you really are interested in and admire and get to know them. Again, go to the office hour, invite them to a coffee, walk with them for half a minute while they're going to their next meeting, whatever it is. Um, you have a lot of access that I did not have back in the day. We were pre-cell phone, pre-Google, literally did not have a UW email. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. Um, if I wanted to go meet with a professor during office hours, I you know, had to hoof it, maybe 20 minute walk to their office, right? And if they happen to have another plan for that time, there might be a paper sign up in the window. I'm, I'm unavailable, not here today. And there goes my office hour conversation, you know? So access was not easy back in the 90s. You have everything at your fingertips. Set up those conversations, pursue these people that you admire and are curious about their story their career path, their educational path. They will be there for you and be there for um, graduate school recommendation letters, um, support for that process, you know, job recommendations, serving as a reference for you. You want to build that list and keep track of those folks and just check in periodically. Make sure you're connected on LinkedIn. Stay close, stay connected. We've You heard the word earlier, Gretchen mentioned the networking arena, but make it personal now. These amazing intellectual leaders are all around you um, within your, your sphere at UW. So take advantage of that. Yes, it might cost you half an hour, hour every quarter. Do it. It will pay off dividends in the future. And I think then I just wanted to add on to that. I, this rock I keep at my desk, it says, stay curious. I just want to challenge you all to stay curious in your time at UW. You're in a very special time of life. Um, seize the day, stay curious about other courses, interdisciplinary courses, people who are different than you, join a club that maybe you're super uh, untalented 
you know, maybe you don't know how to do underwater basket weaving, go join that club. I don't know. Just broaden yourself, design yourself that, um, in ways that are comfortable and uncomfortable. So thank you. And next autumn. Sure. Um, so I think that one of the things I would recommend doing is really thinking about, you're going to have probably tons of different jobs over the course of your life. and Or maybe not, maybe you'll just have one. I don't know, but more than likely you're going to have multiple. I would encourage you to think about who you want to be at the end of your career path, right? So you know, the first couple of jobs, you might be like, oh, this isn't a big deal. It's just my first or second job. You know, eventually I'm going to be the CEO of, you know, whatever company. So whoever that is at the end of that path, start behaving like that person now. What does that lifestyle of that person look like? What time do they get up in the morning? How do they dress? How do they present themselves? And behave, act as if you are that person already. You are not the job, the company you work. You are not the boss that you have, right? You can, and that is your personal brand that you will carry with you everywhere you go. So every job you have is equally as important as the other job because there are impacts that you're making, connections you're leaving behind. So that would be the one thing that I would say is act currently the and behave in the way that you want to end your career. And now Gretchen. And now. Um, yeah, I, I want to be crunchy and <laughs> say like, um, really get great at, at being a good friend and, you know, and, and really hone those friendships and, and learn how to take care of each other. Um, I think that that will serve you in, in your life. So that's my, my crunchy answer. Um, my, my workplace answer is to really try to hone and, and figure out what your working style is. Uh, when I got into this, I, I worked for some people that are really just like, let's just talk about story organically. And I would find myself getting lost or getting anxious because we weren't getting enough work done, what I perceived as work. Um, there was a lot of crosstalk or YouTube videos. I'm like, this is really stressing me out. Um, and I realized that even though I'm in a really creative field, I need to be organized. So when I started running rooms, I have a list of, you know, by my side of what we need to get through through the day. I open each morning with saying, this is what I'd like to get done today. Just being really clear with my goals and objectives. Um, and that, like, it just released all my stress. And now, like, even if we don't get through my to-do list, at least I, I know what, what we have left to do. So I think it would be, you know, just really drilling down in, in into your heart and like, how do I work best? Um, and how do I communicate to those those that I'm working with? how we can best work together. So I think that, that was, it took me a long time, but um, if you find that it will be a lot easier to get through the day. And now McCall. Yeah, now, it, like I said, it's already been brought up, but networking is huge. And and I'll, I'll share this quote with you guys. And I wish I had more time and my, my connection wasn't so poor. Um, I feel like I didn't, I didn't get to share the way I wanted to, but uh, I'll leave you guys with this quote. It's not about what you know, and I think we know the second half of that, it's who you know, right? But there's another level to that that uh, that that phrase um, that I want to stress to you guys. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know, and more importantly, it's about who knows you. And I bring this up because I've lived in LA, I lived in LA for 14 years, so I live in the Bay Area now, but I can't tell you how many times somebody's walked in my office when I was, you know, at that USC athletics and I know a lot of people and a lot of people know who I am. And I can't tell you how many times somebody will come in and try to name drop. Okay, cool. Let me call them on my phone right now. And then you call them and they don't know who I'm talking about. So be very careful about how you network because somebody will back check and make sure that you are who you say you are. So I, I bring that up because I've seen a lot of people try to name drop and say that they know certain people and they really don't. And those people don't know who I, I'm mentioning when I when I bring up their name. But I also bring that up on, on, on a flip side, right? So it's not who you know, but it's what you know, and more importantly, who knows you. And I, and I stress the who knows you because you might have something that you, you want to work on or that you want to do. I wanted to work at Stanford eventually, right? 
I put that out in the atmosphere many, many years ago. Somebody who knows me and knows me well knew that about me. And Stanford called me before I could call them, right? When people know you, when people know what you're trying to do, it's easier for them to also call you, right? So uh, I, I stress uh, and I, I piggyback on, on my other panelists that it's really important to, to develop those connections and relationships so that people really know who you are. Um, because if they have an opportunity, they know who to call. Um, and also if somebody brings up your name in, in those spaces, it's always met with a positive reaction. So um, um, don't be like a lot of people in Hollywood and try to name drop and you actually don't know anybody take the time to develop relationships. Um, and as it relates to just my per my job right now, I can't stress to you how important it is to just make sure you're maintaining those relationships. Before I ask anybody for $5 million, we've had a couple of nice dinners, right? Like I don't, I don't ask for millions of dollars without developing a, a developing a relationship, but that, that goes across the board, whether it's personal, professional, whatever it is, if people don't know who you really are, they're not going to want to do business with you. And ultimately that's what you're trying to do is develop a business relationship. So um, I can't stress that, stress that enough. Make sure you continue to network authentically. I have a, I have a funny question or a quick story about name dropping um and the, and I think the students will get a little chuckle out of this so when I went to UW um you know I I moved out of Washington to SoCal but when I was at UW my father now is a retired police officer from Mercer Island and so I was driving at one point and got pulled over uh because I was speeding and you know I said you know, I'm I'm so sorry. You know, my my dad is the is the chief over um, Mercer Island Police Department. Thinking, you know, he would be like, well, all right. He then very clearly said to me, then you should have you should know better. And he handed me my ticket, and so my name dropping backfired on me. <laughs> so be careful when you're name dropping that you're doing it in the right way. <laughs> That's very true. I was gonna say. Again, I'm Megan. I do our alumni relations and outreach work. Um, and I've met with a number of alums, whether it's through our career exploration trips or hosting these panels. And a thing that I felt like resonated that I would be remiss not to mention is that when you're keeping those networks and those relationships, make sure that they're authentic. Don't just reach out when you need something. Don't just reach out when you're looking for a job. Um, and so like, Correct, you said your crunchy answer is like keep close friends, be a good friend. But at the end of the day, that is really important. So like people can tell when you're not being authentic if you're just like showing up when you need something or are really fake. Like and people don't like it. You can tell, especially if there are people in a communications background, especially with a focus on interpersonal relationships. You can identify really easily when someone's just kind of not being real and so make sure that like as you build connections and take advantage of like coffee chats or take advantage of like opportunities to connect with mentors or or reach out to panelists after the 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 panel is over right but like don't just do it when you need something or like strategically like make sure you're building a relationship and and a, con a connection that's beyond what they can give to you because a true relationship should be dual sided and like benefit both parties. And so just keep that in mind. It's like, yes, it's really easy to be like, oh, I have this many connections on LinkedIn and yada, yada, yada. But like, would they go back to you? Would they say your name in a meeting? Would they would they take your name to the table? And so um, that was just something I felt like is something I've heard from other panels and have seen in my own career um, that I just wanted to, to bring forth in this conversation as well. Um, and now if Victoria could share. Yeah, uh, definitely keep those relationships. I would like to piggyback and just say um, meeting with your counselors there at UW and having them look over your resume when you're ready to apply for an internship or a real job. I got some great advice from my uh, counselor there and that helped, like I said, to, to do the internship. If you are applying for internships or jobs, always remember the follow-up. You would be surprised how many students do not write, oh, thank you for meeting with me. Um, I, I interview young students 
uh, well, not young students, but students coming out of college all the time or in their undergraduate uh, degree program for our internship program. And the students that always stick out to me are the ones who are good about following up and saying, hey, thank you for taking that time to meet with me, even if it's a couple of sentences, um, because by and large, a lot of students are not doing that. And that's just a helpful tip. The other thing that I would say is if you have the opportunity to do a writing course that is in AP style in the journalism program at any time that take advantage of that. I always consider myself a very good writer and was, you know, getting really high grades on all of my papers. And then when I worked on a writing staff here in DC, I remember them really talking to me about AP style and I didn't really understand that. Um, so if you have that opportunity to, to learn that in school and take a journalism class, that will help you quite a bit with writing for news style, especially if you want to do more communications that's targeted um, in traditional media forms that would just be something that I would recommend to do. And then the other thing is maybe if you have any classes that are geared toward multimedia development, I won't speak to the other panelists, but I know for us, anytime we have students who are coming out and they have experience working in video or doing some sort of social media thing, these are new skills that you guys are learning that none of us on this panel probably knew at the time. And um, it's refreshing. It's great to see all of these great skills that are going to take communications to the next level. I've, I'm always impressed with the caliber of students that are graduating today and just all the different ways that they're going to push our, you know, push the workforce forward in positive ways in the future. So any, any time that you have a chance to refine some of those skills, that will help you immensely in the future. Thank you so much for answering all our questions. And students, put any of your questions in the chat if you have any. May I ask uh, just a complimentary question to here? With the permission of the moderator, Elizabeth. Yes. <laughs> First, thank you. So would you um, comment on uh, how do you feel yourself um, still connected to UW being an alumni, including participating in this event today? Uh, what role are you playing in helping UW communities, including the students of current time? Thank you. Um, I could jump in. I would just say uh, the DC Dogs is very active here in the DC area. So these are alumni from all different years, all different um, degrees, and they get together really pretty regularly. I was involved with them for a short while, but now that I have two small children at home, I don't get to do the bar calls with them as much, but I do stay in touch with them. And, you know, anytime that there's school games or something. We have our pride days or whatever, and we're all purple. And in fact, there's a guy um, at my daughter's school who's in second grade across the street. And the other day I was walking to, to walking her to school and wearing my UW sweatshirt, which usually on work from home days, I wear those pretty much every day. Everyone knows I'm a Husky, uh, but he saw me and he immediately was like, aren't you in the wrong Washington? And he's wearing his UW hat. So I don't know. I'm not as involved with some of the students in the current communications program just because I'm on the other coast. Uh, but as much as possible, if I'm a resource to others who want to come to DC, if you're interested in coming to DC and doing an internship out there, I'm glad to put my email address right here in the chat or you can look me up on LinkedIn and I can give you advice on that um, if that's something that you want to talk about offline. I'm always available and happy to do that. Yeah, same. I, I am not very active, but I would love to be, um, you know, Megan knows I 
lived in Southern California for the last 11 years and just this month moved to Arizona. So I'm in a different location, but would love to, to engage. And some of the questions that are kind of coming up, um, one of the questions was, what's made you the most nervous in your career? And, you know, at one time it was pretty common, the public speaking thing, which, you know, I had to quickly get over always talking to strangers in sales. The, what somebody did one time was recorded me, right? And I got to watch myself um, engage in communication. And that was, I mean, talk about cringy and crunchy, horrible, but it was the thing that benefited me the most to kind of work through some of the quirks that I didn't even realize I had. Um, and then more or less interested in meeting with a current student, I would love to to meet with any student and have any kind of chat. I think, you know, giving back, you know, it makes us feel good too, right? So you, as students, you don't have to prove your worth. I don't think to reach out to us, it's just the the intention. And you, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So you might not even know what to ask of us, but just reaching out and making that connection, I think is is super important for you. So feel free to do that, please. Someone wants to know what types of shows does Gretchen work on? Oh, uh, I'd say most of them you've never heard of. Um, a bunch of them you will never see because they didn't make it past the writer's room. Um, you might have heard, I, I worked on uh, Grace and Frankie and WandaVision are like the, the shows that people may have heard of. But um, I primarily uh, like to write comedy, but also getting into murder mysteries. I love a good murder mystery. Come on. <laughs> But like, but back, uh, you know, piggybacking on the what makes you the most nervous in my line of work, sometimes I'm in two different rooms a year. So it is like you just jump in and like I, I never really get to work with people for very long. Um, but again, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm always pulling a couple people from each room like, OK, you're mine now. Um, you're going to be my life forever. But it, it's just a, a that authenticity that we keep talking about, you know, like this is who I am. I might not share all of myself day one because that's a little bit scary, but, you know, just being authentically curious about people um, and being there to pull from the bachelorette, um, being there for the right reasons, you know, like I'm here to help write a show. I'm not here to play game of Thrones and try to like topple the, the head person. Like I, you know, I can, pitch a joke here and there, whatever you need me for. I'm like, I'm the perfect soldier. <laughs> like you, you can just, you know, put, put me to work. So I think that if you approach any job that you're going into with like, what can I do? As long as people aren't taking advantage of you and you can kind of gauge that, but um, just be ready. Cause you never know what opportunity will, will come um, and, or what you might be interested in. If I had to do it all over again, I would be an editor. And I didn't even know that that was a job before I came here and it was already way too late. Um, so, you know, just, just be open to, to all the different opportunities that are afforded to you. And another question for Gretchen, um, how long did it take you to, after graduation to feel established in the entertainment industry? Not yet. Uh, is that, is that a fair answer? Uh, I had, I, I lucked into a really great, uh, corporate job for about 10 years when I moved out here and I realized that I acting wasn't for me. I didn't have an, a thick enough skin for it. Um, and so it took me about 10 years in this job that I, I really enjoyed, but wasn't super fulfilling before I, um, I, I gained the confidence to really make a go as a writer. And now I'm feeling it, it took a good 10 years for me to feel like I kind of have my legs. But again, who knows, you know, five months strike next year, <laughs> It could happen again, and then I'm waiting tables, which I also love doing. So happy to do that again. Um, there was a question at the at the bottom from Steve. It says, "Have you ever been in awe of anyone who with whom you've interacted professionally?" Um, but I think in all of your respective roles, you've probably gotten to meet and work with some cool people. Um, we can open that up a little bit broader beyond just the show, right? But um, how do you? interact and remain poised is the phrase um, when you're working with people who like have your big kid jobs or have like aspirational careers or might not be folks that you like that have a little bit of like shock and awe to them can can each of you kind of dig in a little bit on that
Um, I, I mean, I have a quick answer um, on, you know, I can, I can tell you a story of when I was not poised and I was so, I, I watched this guy on YouTube and he was so smart. He was just a, just a genius. And he was um, the CIO at the time of a hospital in Alaska. And he was taking like quantum theory and integrating that with his, the way that he was engaging with technology and children. And it was just, and I watched so much of him that, you know, when I arrived, I kind of felt like I knew him and he did not know me. And I was just like, you know, I held it together through the meeting. And at, at the end, when he walked me out, I hugged him. And it was so weird and awkward because he was not prepared for that. It wasn't like that was it. But I just kind of felt like I was saying goodbye to a friend or something. And so anyways, he laughed. We laugh about it now. And, you know, he's been a great customer for many years. But, you know, I couldn't keep it together for that long. But I will say, you know, in my line of work, when I go out and I talk to a CIO or a CEO at an organization, I mean, that's a you know, my team, you know, that I've led has asked me that question, like, how do you go out there and just what do you talk about? Because you can't go out and meet with someone and just fire off questions, right? You need to, to show that you know a little bit about them. And I think when you show that and you are trying, and even if you're wrong, right? Hey, I learned, you know, I was doing a little research and, you know, I think you did an interview here and may have said this, or I think you guys might've won an award, you know, and it might be wrong and you might show that you're stumbling a little, but I think people want to help you, right? That's our nature. And so if they see that you're trying and you're putting forth the effort um, and you're excited about them, again, it's about that intention, right? So do a little preparation before you go and meet with people, um, don't just say, you know, I'll go there and figure it out when I'm there and ask some questions, but, you know, be prepared. I mean, that's a, it's a, seems like an obvious skill, but, um, but not so much. Okay. okay. Emma, Emma wants to know what know types of tech skills, skills, either with Excel or other media programs, do you find that companies are looking for when hiring? If anyone wants yeah. to jump in. I would just say video. Um, video skills for us has been a huge thing because it seems like everyone and their mother wants a small video for marketing their program at our association or sometimes we need to get information to our members and in a short small you know nugget of information so if you have those video skills that's helpful um and then i saw another question in here too if you don't mind and I, i'll answer it um like a moment that maybe define your career and made you the most nervous at the same time um i was working at the nuclear energy institute which is a trade association they represent nuclear power companies and i was there maybe when I was like 25 or something. And um, there was a Fukushima nuclear plant meltdown in Japan. And at the time I was just, we had just started a web communications department within the organization. So our communications VP had um, a boss in charge of me and then it was me. So I was doing the website and blog and social media and Twitter was new. Um, and right when this happened, um, in Japan, you know, they had the tsunami, they had the earthquake, huge natural disaster and the nuclear power meltdown on top of it. Um, it also happened to be the first week of my last, um, quarter of grad school. So I was nine weeks away from graduating if only I could get my senior capstone project in before that time and my boss who is incredibly introverted very talented person at all things web and analytics and all those things very introverted literally walked out the front door and never came back he still had things in his desk but the the 
pressure that came on him immediately just made him crack. And so when I talk about crisis communications, I kind of say tongue in cheek that I learned Twitter during a nuclear meltdown because all of a sudden I was in charge of all things web. And so we were getting all the communications out during that time. So a lot of blogging, our website was crashing because we were the only ones who were putting content out at that time. Um, we had federal agencies calling us anytime our website went down because they were hamstrung and unable to post content, but we were able to post content about what was happening at the situation just because TEPCO was one of our member companies, um, their international association. So that was a very, very challenging moment, but I will say that, you know, we, we did work very well as a team. Um, I did graduate from my grad school program and I went to school here at DW, so different W, but still in the name, Washington, still in the name. Um, did get to graduate on time. They were very nice about that, but it was a defining moment of stepping up to the plate and realizing that you may not be the oldest person in the room. You may not have the most, you know, the best career stripes um, on, but you are able to take that leadership role and help inspire the other people in the team to do what was necessary. And so that's definitely what I did was step up to the plate and worked with 30 different people in our organization and consultants to develop the content, which was how we responded um, in the days and weeks to come. So I, I don't recommend that crisis situation for anyone, uh, but definitely that was something that defined my career and realized that, you know, I, I had great leadership skills and able to help others, even on issues that I was not um, good at. You know, I was never a science person. That's why I did communications. I always joke that a day that I have to do math is not a good day, um, but somehow I have ended up in very scientific and technical uh, areas. And that's because they need good communicators. These are people who don't know how to communicate. So getting that message out there, but that's kind of my long winded story. And now I'm not in the nuclear energy industry, but not for that reason. Um, I definitely wanted a, a change and do something a little bit new. Um, and so that's when I made the leap to agriculture after that, but defining moment. I wanted to address if I could the question, what would make you more or less interested in meeting with an undergrad, you know, to share my story and, and to listen to yours, et cetera. For me, it's the simple concept, but the powerful concept of paying it forward. You know, someone met with me when I was your age, you know, sophomore, freshman, whatever y'all are in this class, probably every um, level is represented here. Um, so just paying it forward, you know, I would meet with you because someone did that for me and I will I, I will always find the hour or 30 minutes to, to meet with an undergrad, whether it's here at Whitman or through UW or a friend's college kid, whoever it may be. My own kids are in college right now. So the, the world of networking and internships is very present for me on a personal level. Um, so yeah, just that idea that someone paused, gave me a helping hand, opened a door that I said yes to and was able to walk through that opened up the next opportunity. I would absolutely do it for you, even if we're meeting for the very first time. The UW bond is really powerful, right? I think everyone here on the on the panel is an extremely proud Husky. Someone said that earlier. Um, I met my husband at UW. Our third child is currently waiting on her admissions letter. Um, we're, we'd be thrilled to have one of our three kids be a Husky. The other two chose to go elsewhere, but uh, more power to them. But um, we're proud Huskies and we have a bond with you all and just through that, the alumni network. And then just to piggyback off that, where's the best place to look for internships? You start with your department chair, your staff, your, your professors, um, ask your peers, right? A lot of the best internships are handed down year after year to fellow Huskies because you all show up and perform well. And so there's, there's cycles of opportunities out there if you just ask questions and put your neck out a little bit people want to help you really go forward with bravery. And then I just wanted to say that kind of summarizes everything I've tried to say today, but be you, um, everyone else has already taken. Now that's not my quote, I wish it was, but Oscar Wilde said that, but be you, the best version of you, no one else can do that but you, so. I just want to throw out there again, I'm Megan, I do some of our outreach and alumni relations work. Um, and so we have a, a good number of folks who reach out um, from like the community side looking for internships, our advising team is really 
um, important, and they will help execute a lot of internships, spreading up, spreading the word when we get there. Um, but one thing that I wanted to put a shameless plug in is the two students sitting right here, Jesse and Elizabeth, are interns for the department. And so we're uniquely poised as a communication department to provide hands-on learning for folks in the communication field. And so we do have three internships available each year. Um, one is focusing on event planning, one is working on web and content development, and then we have another that's doing graphic and video content creation. And so whenever we send out that email through the advising listserv, keep an eye out, submit your application. These two can, I think, affirm that we're not too scary, um, but we uh, were, we're always looking for folks and have opportunities within the department itself, and it is paid. We do not like unpaid internships here anymore, um, and so we try our best to like get students into positions that will pay you, um, but if you're interested in that, again, Anise has, has my contact information, and so um, I'm happy for him to send that out to the to everyone. If you're interested in learning more, um, you also are welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, but keep an eye out on that. And then the other piece that Susan I think queued up really really well was folks want to reach out. Everyone wants to support someone when they're coming out of college. I feel like especially with being in in school or freshly graduating. Um, that is a unique time where if you just like, hey, can we go get coffee? Or, hey, can we talk and do an informational interview over Zoom? I'm trying to figure out what type of industry I want to work in, or I want to learn more about the different kinds of careers you can do in the field. People are more than willing to do that. Everyone loves coffee or tea, right? And so just like being being willing to reach out, do some, some LinkedIn creeping, do some internet searching for people that you're interested in having careers that may resemble, right? Like kind of, I think what Autumn was saying of like, who do you want to be? Like get to know them, have that opportunity to build that relationship. Because most of the time, especially right now at this stage of your life, people will say yes. <laughs> and it could be scary reaching out, right? Like I, I, I think back to like some of my very first, you know, when I was trying to reach out when I first moved here, I'm like, oh, I don't even know what questions to ask. But maybe just like someone else was saying, just come prepared, whether it's about the the industry that this person works in or just more generally, just like, you know, what, what it was your favorite thing about UW, you know, just come prepared with some questions and that will always get the ball rolling because oftentimes, not oftentimes, but the last few times people have come to me, it's like I'm pulling teeth to try to get information out of them when they had come to me to ask about you know, my industry and I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, give them a monologue. I, I want to have a connection with somebody. So wherever you can, you can get in on that conversation, just, just come prepared with some, some questions even if they're weird like would you rather fly or be invisible you know like start a conversation that just feels a little bit more casual and comfortable at least that's what I enjoy same goes yeah. for job interviews too make sure you have lots of questions lined up about either the industry or the company or the person um, I feel like that's another another piece that's really important too yeah I was just gonna say you know, people love to talk about themselves. So if you have questions that, you know, you know that you, something about this person you're connecting with, you but you don't know what to ask them, I would still reach out, schedule a time to chat and just have a couple questions that get them talking about themselves. And just be curious, right? And so just, you know, like The Rock said, um, you know, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, don't, don't, if you can get people talking about themselves, they'll love you forever. Also something that I have been working on with a mentee of mine, because I, I do so many, so many general meetings, which are basically like first dates with producers, like you're just getting to know each other. And um, I've really, over the last few years, really worked on my bio. So like, oh, tell me about yourself. And I can have... Uh, you know, a two minute version, a five minute version of my story, you know, that goes from, you know, high school through moving to LA. And it always includes, of course, uh, moving to Seattle for my my favorite four and a half years. Um, but just have something a little bit prepared. So it's not like, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you this, you know, so what I've been building with her is your story with different points of connection, because you never know if, if someone lived in Seattle, they might be like, oh, let's talk about Seattle or, um, you know, this is what, you know, I, I worked at this one 
one restaurant. Oh, I love that restaurant. So just, just kind of working on that. So you have something prepared so it doesn't feel, and, and you work on it. So it feels like it's off the cuff, but it, it really is prepared and you can come in looking nice and shiny to somebody. And also feel free to apologize about not having all of the questions ready, right? So, so say, you know, forgive me. I am just so excited and so interested to talk to you. I do have a couple of really high level general questions. Um, and I'm hoping that during the course of this conversation, I'll come up with some more pointed ones. Um, but just be honest. I mean, people, it's, I talk to my team so much about the intention and the feeling that you leave behind, right? We say statements like, I don't know what it was about that person, but I just really liked her. Or, you know, I don't know what it was about that person, but I just don't want to do business with them. So there's, there's a feeling that we don't talk about very often that comes, and I thought for many years that as a woman, you know, we're kind of labeled as emotional and touchy feely. So I never used those words feel, but I got over that and it's very much a real thing. Right. And so the intention when you sit down with somebody, I tell my team all the time, we're in sales. If you sit down and you've decided that you're going to sell this person, you know, uh, server, um, you're gonna the the conversation that you have and the feeling that you leave is going to be different than if you sit down you have the confidence to know i know i need to sell something i will figure it out and right now i will serve this moment to the best of my ability and i will be curious about this person and what they have going on and if it just so happens that they need a server then i'm happy to fulfill that need that feeling in the conversation you're going to have is going to be completely different so just trust that your your intention is pure and it'll lead you all the way through the conversation. All right, I, I will just add too. I mean, I, was just say, I would just add to coming out of COVID, people crave conversations, especially when you can meet in person. Um, I don't know if I'm a little biased because ag industry and DC, they're all very much sit in rooms, handshake kind of people or in ag, we're huggers, we're all a bunch of huggers. Um, but, you know, they crave that attention and being around people again. And, and like I said, many of the people out there, especially alumni, we want to help that next generation be successful. So don't think everyone's out there to get you or they think you're idiots. We don't think you're idiots. We think you're going to do great things. And we're very excited to see where you bring us in the future. All right. I want to be mindful of time. I know we're, we're close. We got a couple minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you again to all of our panelists. It was wonderful having you all. Um, I know the virtual panels are a little bit of a different format, but I love that it allows us to engage um, with folks that aren't just located in Seattle. Once a quarter, um, we do this um, panel, and so we're going to try and do one, one in person, but like it's really great to see the virtual and how it allows folks from all over the country to, to be able to join us for this um, opportunity. And I just wanted to say thank you all for investing and, and taking the time to share your expertise and stories and and advice for our future generation. Um, like I said, people are invested in supporting um, the next generation of people. You're, you all in the class are the ones who are gonna be like moving this industry forward and, and is gonna be, are gonna be the ones that are gonna be in the next CEO, CI, CIO positions. And so people really wanna invest in and build that relationship um, because they know like you're the future of the industry and the future of the field. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I'll put my email in the chat and I'm happy to help facilitate any conversations with our alums. Um, and then again, I recommend build your LinkedIn, use your LinkedIn, get to know folks. But um, again, if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you again to our alums. Any passing it on to you? Oh, no, I just wanted to thank you all again for coming to this class. It has been really a great learning curve for me to hearing from all your experiences. And I do wish you all the best uh, with your leadership positions and your rest of your career aspirations. 
and thank you for extending your invitation for our students to connect with you and willing to listen to them. And th thanks also to the students for participating in this class. I hope I, you have learned something very, very valuable, which you don't hear every day in our uh, theoretical lectures. Uh, so again, yeah, I will stop the recording now. I wish you all the best with the rest of your day. So thank you again. And I will hang out if, in case anyone has any after classroom chats or questions. So thank you. Thank you so much.